Good morning, church. Good morning. What a great morning of worship already and being in the Lord's presence and growing together in Christ. And welcome back to our series. We're in this great series called Making History, Making His Story Come Alive in the Heart of Our Family. And we're all a part of a family, right? You know, we're all kids. We have parents, we have grandparents, we have aunts and uncles, we have cousins. We're part of a biological uh, family, but we're also part of the family of God. We're a part of God's family here, and none of us are spiritual orphans, right? We're placed inside the family of God to learn and to grow and to become deeper in our walk with the Lord. And so we're talking about this series, and this is a strategic time. It's a great time for this series because, you know, kids are going back to school, and so you're kind of setting new patterns, new season of life, and new priorities, and saying, hey, I want to make Christ the foundation of our home and moving forward. But we're also in a new kind of year here at church as we look at community groups launching and men's ministry and women's ministry and kind of saying, hey, I want to be a part. I want to see growth in my life and my family spiritually as we mature in our walk with the Lord. Last week, we talked about what is the vision God's given you for your family. And this week, we want to talk about what are you teaching? What are you teaching? You know, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, as cousins, we're always teaching. We're constantly teaching. As a dad, I know my job is to teach, right? I, I, I you know, taught my kids, you know, to, to tie their shoes. That was a big deal. It was so exciting to eat with a fork. That was a big deal, right? I mean, it was just awesome to throw a football, some of these big priorities in life and seeing them learn and grow. But I remember one time when we were at dinner, when my daughter was about two, two and a half, Kate, our youngest, was there, we are, you know, and here we are as a whole family, we're around the table, and I've got three girls in the house, okay, and my wife, Lisa, and so there's a lot of words, a lot of words happening in our house, right, and so we're around the dinner table, and everybody's talking, and Kate, our youngest, at about two years old, she's trying to get everybody's attention, and everybody's got all these conversations going, and she just hits the table like that, and she says, darn it, but it wasn't darn it, okay? So, <laughs> and we were like, uh, looking around at each other, like, what just happened here? You know, we all stopped, and we're looking at her, and her eyes get this big, you know, we're like, uh, we don't use those words. And then I said, who taught you that, you know? And she's like, uncle so-and-so, you know, I won't throw him under the bus today, right? <laughs> and we were like, we're going to go call uncle so-and-so, right? What have you been teaching? But the fact is we're always teaching. There's always little eyes that are watching us and seeing everything we do. And so we kind of put together a little video just for parents here about what are you teaching your kids? Watch this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Landon. Hi, my name's Ayla. Hi, my name's Ivy Rose. Hi, my name's Zoe. Hi, my name's Emerson. My name's Ben. My name is Audrey. Hi, my name's Luke. What is one thing that you've learned from your parents? They taught me how to do backflips. Learned soccer. My dad taught me about sports that was actually golf. Okay. Do you like to golf? Have you ever golf? I love golf, but my mom teached me about tennis and I like tennis. Do you like that better? Yes. She was at floaties. No, no. She said her parents told her how to swim without floaties. I learned about back to ball. They taught me. Hurry up, everyone. Let me time. I learned um, ABCs. Mm -hmm. I learned ABCs too. Have your parents taught you about how to eat healthy? Yes. What, what do you think are some healthy foods? Chicken nuggets, noodles, tomatoes. I have to eat my dinner before I get a tree. They tell me about Jesus. Have they taught you anything about Jesus or about what he did? Uh, Jesus died. Whenever Jesus died, he come back from three days. On the, the third day was Easter, so he come back on that day. Who's your favorite character in life? Uh, God. What are the parents talking about, Oh, uh, she. 
Do you? Yeah, right. Do you know? Do you know the guy who God's son is? God. <laughs> I got a new Bible verse. Ooh. It's called. I love you all, Fatal Friday. Philippians, Philippians 10, 100. 10, 100? Wow. Yeah! <laughs> Isn't that great? That's your kids, right? <laughs> that's our kids. And that's awesome. It's awesome. But what are we teaching? What are we teaching our kids? That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of Ephesians 10, 100. No, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there's some Bibles in the back. I'd love for you to grab one. Uh, it's yours. If you don't have a Bible, you can put your name in it and keep it. We'll also put the scripture on the screen. And also the scriptures inside the worship guide or on the worship guide if you want to follow along with us today. But Ephesians here, the New Testament, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right there in that area. And the Apostle Paul is writing the church in Ephesus. And there's a church and it's going through some challenging times. And so he's saying, hey, you guys, you got to stay strong. You got to stay strong. And he starts this kind of instructions to Christian households in chapter five. And he starts off at, at, toward the end of chapter five talking about marriages and saying, hey, you got to have a strong marriage. Work on your marriage. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, husbands and wife love each other. And then he comes to chapter six and he starts talking about the family there. And he says this, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Now notice there's not an expiration date on that, right? It's not until they're in middle school and they know more than you, right? You know, more than their parents or they're in high school or college. No. You children obey your parents. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. That, that we have this calling, right? And when you have a healthy family, we know it's when we're in a healthy family, when things are good, when things are right, man, there's just a joy there. You can enjoy life. But when our family dynamics are off, when it's challenging, man, it just weighs you down. And, and so Paul's saying, I'll just encourage you in this. And he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, some of you, you just read that and you go, wow, that's me, all right? I grew up in that home. And my dad was so hard on me and so tough on me. And, I, and I'm sorry. I got to tell you, I'm sorry if that's you. But I also encourage you, you know, two things. Don't project that onto God. <laughs> he is the perfect heavenly father and he loves you. And, and secondly, don't repeat that pattern. Okay, you can change, you make a difference. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, notice this instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Instead, you have a calling, you have a responsibility for your household. And guys, we live in a culture, we live in a society where marriages are under attack and families are under attack. And Paul comes along and goes, listen, I want you to have a great marriage. I want you to have a great family. I want you to thrive. I want you to succeed. And I want that for you as well. Because I believe God is at work in your family that we can make history, impact generations as Christ comes alive in our families and in the family of God today. So if you're taking notes, here's some things I'd love for you to write down. I just want us to get this today, write these things down. First of all, we are the primary disciples of our children. Do you notice that? He says, children obey your parents. <laughs> Wasn't obey the government, you know, wasn't obey, you know, your, your teachers or your bosses. Or that God, in God's sovereignty, God placed us in a family. God put your kids in your family. And you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. You have a calling and a responsibility. You are the primary disciples for your children. And as parents, as grandparents, aunts and uncles and teachers and coaches and church family, it's not someone else's job this is your job. This is your job. This is your time. What are you teaching? What are you passing along? This is our calling right now. So listen, don't outsource your parenting. You know, we live in a society where we outsource everything right now, don't we? We outsource our cooking. You know, who has time to cook, right? We got restaurants, we got Uber Eats. You know, it's just like, 
we, we outsource our cleaning. You know, we've got, you know, Molly made. We have everyone to come over and clean the house. We outsource our car washing. We take our cars to an auto spa. I'm like, what is that, right? I don't go to a spa. I take my car to, I mean, like, what is it? Well, like, we outsource our dog walking. Who has time to watch their dogs? We hire a teenager to walk my dog. But listen, don't outsource your parenting. You can outsource those other things. I don't care. Fine. Great. But, but don't outsource this. And sometimes we go, oh, I'm so busy. Hey, it goes by like that. You and I have to make a point and a priority to say, this is my calling. This is my job. This is my responsibility. And I've got this time as a parent, as a grandparent, as an aunt or an uncle, as a coach, as a teacher to pour into those entrusted to me. About a year ago, I had lunch with a guy and uh, he's a guy who's in business in our community. He's been at our church like off and on for about eight years, right? Him and his family, they've got two boys and, and, and they've always been hit or miss, right? We always, you know, they'll start to come and then it's like, oh, I can't get involved. And then, you know, like it gets busy in life and he travels his job and, and all this, but they're great people. Love them, love them, love them. But I'm just always like, come on, you know, this is your time, jump in. And so we're at lunch and, and we're talking and, and, and I'm hearing about the family and what's going on. His wife's a teacher, she's great. She's amazing and wonderful. And they've got two boys and one's a freshman at UT at this time about a year ago. And the other one is in a junior in high school and they're in sports. And he's telling me all the things that they're doing and all the activities and stuff. And, and I just looked and kind of out of the blue, I just kind of go, well, you know what? You, you're, you're a really good dad. And he stopped and he goes, no, I'm not. I go, and he goes, that's why I'm here. And tears started welling up in his eyes. And he goes, neither one of my boys have been baptized. He goes, I missed it. He goes, they were always in my house. And we just got all these other things going on. We were always busy. We always made other things priorities. And I just missed it. And he goes, would you pray? Would you pray for my boys? He goes, I love them, but man, I want them to know the Lord. I want them to be grounded in the Lord. Would, would you just pray? And you could feel it, man. You just feel the weight right there. And I just thought, man, I, my life, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. Here's the next one. Like, if you're taking notes here, we all have a responsibility for the next generation. And guys, it's, it's, it's all of us, right? These aren't just your kids. These are our kids. And there's a lot of them. You can hear them in preschool and children and students and praise God. But... But this is our time and this is our opportunity. And what are we teaching? What are we pouring into those who come behind us? It, it, you know, it's amazing. Sometimes people will come up to me and they'll go, well, I'm just going to let my kids figure out this whole faith thing. Right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things. I'm just really not going to talk to them about it. I'm going to let them figure it out. And I'm like, really? So you're going to let them figure out that, you know, cocaine's bad for them too? You're going you know, to let them figure out that, you know, you should murder? You get, you know, what are you doing? I mean, like, if you really believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, if you really believe that there is eternity that awaits, you're going to want to talk to your kids about Jesus. You're going to want to talk to your grandkids. You're going to want to talk to your nieces. You're going to want to talk to your nephews. You and I as a church are going to be passionate about the next generation. Because where else are they going to hear about Jesus? And God said, I placed them in your family. I placed them in your community. I placed them in your body for a reason and for a purpose. Here's number two. Look at this. Your presence matters. Your presence matters. Honor your father and mother. Parents are the primary influence on a child's life. And as a parent, as your kids grow up, you kind of think, oh, I don't know about that. You know, it's, it's friends, right? Because their friends have this big pool. Or it's culture and, and all these things. It's Hollywood. It's all these movies. That's the, no, 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 no. Research, study after study after study after study will show you that parents are the primary influence of their kid's life. I mean, 18, 21 and beyond. Think about it in your own life. If you have a great relationship with your parents, even as an adult, when you get in trouble or something, who do you call first? Many times, right? It's, hey, I'm going to reach out to mom, I'm gonna reach out to dad. I'm going to, hey, okay, I need some advice. I need to, you are there. That's you now. That's us now. Parents are the primary influence on a child's life. Guys, listen, your words matter. Your words matter. Whoever said this, sticks and stones may break my bones, 
<laughs> Words will never hurt me. They were an idiot, okay? I'm just like, just gonna lay it out there for you. I shouldn't use that word, but it's true, right? It's just, they, that's the dumbest statement that was ever written by any person in the history of the world. Because long after we fell off our bike and scraped our leg, long after the strawberries from sliding into second base are gone, we remember the words that our coach said or that our teacher said, or our small group leader said, or our mom said, or our dad said, and we remember those things. Your words, listen adults, listen to those, your words carry weight. They carry weight. And we gotta think about that. We wanna encourage and we wanna challenge. We want them to be better. We want them to reach their full potential. But our words carry weight. How we say things matters. Your words matter, but also your actions matter. Your actions matter. You are always being watched, whether you know it or not. Your actions matter. People come and ask Lisa and I all the time about this. <laughs> what do you do with your kids and cell phones, right? And people are always saying, there's all kinds of things out there you can read. And, what, and so I'll, I'll just kind of tell you just a couple of things that that we've done. We've got elementary, middle, and high schooler right now, okay? So we're like in the throes of cell phone world, right? And, and, and we had to make a decision. And whatever, this is, this is just what we've done. You can do what you want to do, but this is an area that I think, as a parent, you got to step into, okay? This, this is something that's important. And so we, as a family, we kind of had to come to the decision. We said, hey, we're not going to get cell phones for our kids until they're in seventh grade, now, I know that's kind of crazy, and people are like, I know my kids got a cell phone in their third grade, or all their friends, right? We started hearing that in fourth grade. All my friends have cell phones, right? All fifth grade, all my friends have cell phones. But we realized, we said, we're going to hold off, we're going to wait, we're going to wait. And then whatever you decide to do, that's fine. But, but we said we were going to wait, because when they got in seventh grade, right, now we've got all these extracurricular activities. There's, you know, practice for volleyball, and, you know, cheerleading, and all this, you know, that's happening, and basketball, and, you know, we're, we're all over the place. And this is actually a phone. I don't know if you guys know that, but it actually... Like if they're late for practice or, you know, practice goes long as they can call us. We've tried to teach them that. They still haven't figured it out. But it's, it's amazing. And so, but we said, number one, we're going to wait on that. Number two is when we come into the house, we have a little basket. Everybody drops your phone in. <laughs> right? When we sit down for dinner, or we're going to have a conversation. We're going to drop our phone in the basket. And the first few times it was like, what? You want to, what? Are you kidding me? It's like, take my arm, you know? Like, I can't, but like, no, 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 not your arm, just your phone, right? Put it, put it here. The third rule we have is this, is that you can't take this into your room, okay? You, you be just like, you know, hey, we trust you, we love you, but we, these things stay out there if you're on it for homework or, you know, you're, you're texting a friend or something. Just, just do it out here in the open. Because it's amazing. What comes in through this, right? Stuff we would never allow into our house, right? But it comes in and our, our kids are seeing this. And the fourth rule is, is this for us, is like, okay, I can look at your text messages. I can look at what you have on social media. You know why? Because I'm paying for it, okay? So if you want to go and pay for it and all that, we can figure that out when you go off to college or you're 40 or 50. But right now, I am paying for this and it reserves my right to look at this. I go through your history, I can look at what you're looking up because you know, I want you to know and I want you to be safe and I want you to have some parameters. But what I've come to realize, guys, with this, is that maybe it's not the kids that we need to talk to, maybe it's us. Because <laughs> when you're sitting at a restaurant and you look around and there's mom and dad sitting on their phone going through Instagram the whole time and there's four or five kids over there trying to figure out what to do. And that's why they're reaching for their iPad or they're reaching their phone and they're going, well, well I guess we're not going to talk right here. I guess they're not going to pour into me right here. So, And these things are great and they're wonderful and you can do so many good things with it. But you're also showing to your kids, hey, this is important. And I pray we're not showing this is more important than you. You're more important than this. Our actions matter. Your actions, my actions matter. We've got to learn to be fully present. We've got to learn to be fully present. And guys, I'm talking to me as much as I can. I'm like all the time. I mean, I got texts and emails that fly in all the time. And it's a challenge, but you've got to learn to be fully present. When you walk in and say, hey, I want to listen. I read a study the other day that said parents engage in less than five minutes of meaningful conversation a day with their kids. 
less than five minutes of meaningful conversation. It, it, it's, you know, meaningful conversation isn't, have you done your homework? Or, you know, like, you know, have you, you know, taken in the trash can? You know, meaningful conversation is like, how was your day? You know, what, what's going on? How are you feeling? What's happening in your life? Where are you spiritually? How are you growing? Your presence matters. You're pre- and I'll tell you guys, I mean, I've got a 15-year-old. I don't know how that happened. It just happened overnight. But it goes like that. And then all of a sudden, I know, I mean, I know, I've seen it enough where they're going to go off to college. I'm going to be like, what happened? I, your presence matters. Be fully present during this time. And then remember the goal. Remember the goal. I, I love that. I love where he says, hey, here's this commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. We want to raise kids who love life. We want to raise great kids. But, but here's the thing. Our goal is not just to raise great kids, but to raise godly adults. <laughs> Our goal is to raise godly adults for them to have a foundation, for them to be strong, for them to be well prepared for the world that they're going into. That's our goal as a church. We want to raise up the next generation of Christian leaders. We want to raise up young men and women who are strong and steadfast. Hey, there's the importance of a spiritual foundation. And a lot of times we, we kind of forget about that. We'll go, oh, my kid's so smart. They're, they're doing great geometry. They're knocking it out of the park. That, that's fantastic. That's great. Way to go. Good job. But, but, but do they have a foundation? Do they have a spiritual foundation for making decisions? Because when they leave the house and they have to discern, hey, should I date this guy or not? Should I go to this party or not? <laughs> should I watch this or not, Right? Should I take this job or not? Where are they going to get the wisdom? You know what? It's going to come from here. It's going to come from the foundation I pray that they have from growing up in our house. That they have that foundation in the Lord, the importance of a foundation. You know, make a church a priority because it shows what you value. Uh, Every one of your kids, right? There's going to come a phase, right? where they go, ah, oh, I don't want to go to church, right? I'm tired, I want to sleep in. Now, that doesn't happen much here at Rolling Hills because our family ministry is off the charts. I mean, it's amazing and preschool children and students. But when I was growing up, there came a time in seventh grade when I went to my parents and I was like, I don't want to go to church, right? You know, and you know what my dad said? He goes, well, as long as you live in this house, we go to church. So it's a priority for us, right? We go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night back then, okay? I mean, like we all went everything, right? back then. And he said, here's your option. You can move out. That's, that's an option, right? You know, and if you don't want to live here, but, but as long as you're in our house, we go to church. And I started weighing the options, thinking, okay, seventh grade. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I like church. I love it. So, you know, so, so then I was at church, right? And so then I had to figure out, you know, my basketball, and baseball, and all the schedules around church. But we made church a priority. If your kid comes to you and says, hey, I don't want to go to school, You don't go, okay, sure, don't go to school. I mean, come on now, school's overrated, forget it. No, what do you say? You're like, I don't care, you're going to school, right? You're gonna go to school. But if they come and say, I don't wanna go to church, and you go, okay, well, we're not gonna go to church, what are you saying? You're saying, well, your secular education is much more important than your spiritual education. And we value this (laughs) over this. If your kid comes and says, hey, we're playing soccer and it's three games into the year and I'm hot and I don't want to play anymore. And you go, you can't quit. We're developing character. You got to stick it out. But, oh, well, we just went back to church. No. See, you got to make these things a priority because it shows what you value. Shows what you value. Help them grow to love God, love others, and love themselves. You know, the more I just have been pouring in and thinking about this sermon for today, thinking about, you know, Jesus, he took the 613 commands in the Old Testament, he boiled it down to two, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor, but he said this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And a lot of times we struggle loving our neighbor because we don't love ourselves. And that's not a prideful, arrogant love myself, but that's a healthy love myself. And we want to raise kids who have confidence We want to raise kids whose value is not measured in just their GPA or what their boss says or what their coach says. Their value is measured in what Christ says about them. And they can hold their head high and they can follow God all the days of their life. And man, they love God. And boy, they love people around. And man, they, they have a healthy love for themselves. Remember, remember the goal. Listen, be intentional. Be intentional. 
Be intentional with your words. Be intentional with your actions. Your kids don't need more friends. <laughs> they need a parent and role models. Your kids don't need more friends. And maybe you're saying, oh, I just wish they had more friends. They're great, but there's gonna be different stages, grades, sports, all these things every year around. They're gonna have friends around them. They need a parent. <laughs> They need a role model. They need a coach. They need a teacher who's godly. Somebody they can look up to. See, kids are moving from dependence to independence, right? And we want them to make this transition in a healthy way. And in order to do that, they've got to have some role models. They've got to have people to look up to. But they also need something called this, <laughs> discipline. And discipline is essential. Have you ever noticed that the people who really love you in life are the ones who are willing to tell you no. I mean, the world's gonna tell you, yes, the world's gonna tell you, buy it, smoke it, drink it, spend it. They're gonna tell you, yeah, 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 yeah. But the people who really love you are gonna come in and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know if he's good for you. <laughs> I don't know if he's walking with the Lord. I don't know if you should be doing this. You, you know what, I, I wouldn't do this. But I, they, they need boundaries. They need boundaries. Now, discipline. Never discipline out of anger, always out of love. <laughs> Never discipline out of anger. And, and guys, we've, we've all been there, right? And, and, and praise God for grace. So we've all been there. We've said things. We're like, man, I shouldn't have said that. And you get the eye roll or you just go even more. You just see their face drop. And, and we've all been, it gets, we get busy doing our own thing. And then we don't have patience enough for our kids. But, but never discipline out of anger. I had one of my best friends, he called me several years ago and his kids were like, you know, six, eight, and 10. And, and he gets home from work and he just, he goes, I walked in and he goes, I about lost it. He goes, I, I started yelling and I just had to stop and I stepped out and I, I called you, please pray, please pray right now. I just need it, I need it. And I was like, okay, hold on, calm down, calm down, calm down. We don't discipline out of anger, but we discipline out of love. Love is guidance. Love is, I want you to be your best. Love is, I'm helping you be better. Love is I'm growing you, and we're going to put some boundaries. We're going to put some rules here. Hey, parents, at some point, you got to get to three, okay? Right? I mean, like, it's like you do this, I'm going to count to three. One, two, two and a half, two and three fours, two and 57, 86, right? You can run out of fractions. You know, you're like, I don't even know, because you never get to three. So I don't have any consequences. At some point, you got to get to three and go, you got to go sit in time out. It's a consequence. It's what happens. That's what happens. But we do that out of love. Look at this, plan adventures. See, the way you can discipline is when you have relationship. And you build relationship by spending time together. You gotta plan adventures. Guys, you gotta plan vacations. I, I'm just telling you, your kids, don't miss this, your kids would rather go on an adventure with you in a VW Bug than they had to be sitting at home while you're out trying to work overtime to have a Mercedes convertible. They want to be with you. They want an adventure. They want time. They, and it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, you could go, you know, the Culver's and get the flavor of the day and, and start laughing so hard that, that ice cream comes out your nose and they'll always remember that. It was an adventure. We had fun. We laughed. You know, our family, we love, we love to be together. And I, and I love that. I'm just going, you know what? I know they're going to grow up. I know they're going to go off, but I want, I want to have this time. But we have to be intentional about it. And you've got to be intentional. Plan these things. So Lisa and I and our family, we plan when, they, when our kids turn 10, Lisa takes them on a trip to have the talk, right? You know, we got all girls. I'm like, that's your job, right? You know, so, <laughs> you, know you got it. You go get them, cowgirl, right? You know, so, you know, my dad, my dad, like, he never even thought through that. We're driving in the car, like, you know, I'm 17 or something. It's like, hey, birds and bees, you good? Yeah, I'm, all right. Yeah, okay. All right, good. You know, I keep driving. I, that was it. I'm like... Okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that, but I, I'm, all my buddies will tell me. You, know, so I, you, know, I, you don't want them hearing about it from their buddies, okay? So we said when they're 10 and their body starts to change, and Lisa's like, okay, well, this is gonna be kind of awkward talk, so we'll, we'll do an adventure around it. And so she does like this two-day thing where they go somewhere, and it doesn't have to be super expensive, but just them, and they laugh, and they have fun, and it's, oh, by the way, your body's changing, and here's some of the things that are happening. But, but they look forward to that. When they turn 12, I take them on an adventure. 
And it's just me and them, and it's somewhere educational, but it's somewhere fun. Mabry and I went this summer, we went to Washington, D.C., and we had like this two-day trip, and you know, Southwest flies there, it's a cheap ticket, we got there, we stayed with some friends, but we had a blast. We went to the zoo and watched the panda bears, we still laugh about it, they came barrel rolling down the hill, and we went to the Capitol, we went to the spy museum, she loved that, you know, it was like, but it was an adventure, she still talks about it. When they turned 15 or 16, we'd take them on an international mission trip. And Grace went on our first one, went to Moldova this summer. She's still talking about it. And you know why? Because we live in a bubble here in Williamson County. We want them to get out. We want them to see the rest of the world. We want them to understand how the rest of the world lives. You've got to plan these things. Because I'm telling you, if you don't plan it, it will fly by. And you'll be sitting in a restaurant one day going, oh, pray with me and for me. Plan those and make Make, get this, don't miss this, make memories. You are creating memories. You know, if you think back on your life, you think back to those memories, don't you? You think, our family, we remember this time we went camping and the car broke down and it was, it was miserable and it was a pouring down rain, but man, it was so fun, right? You think about those, you're creating those right now. You are creating those right now. Parents, Grandparents, aunts, uncle, all of us, we're creating those right now. There's, a, there's some grandparents in our church. Every year they have Camp Keck where all their grandkids, six grandkids come and they stay with them for a week and you see them the next Sunday and they look so tired and worn out and they're like, what were we thinking? But you know what? Those kids love it and they look forward to it. And I'm thinking, man, their grandparents are pouring into them. You are creating memories. Last one, look at this. Teach them Jesus. Guys, teach them Jesus. He says, instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Jesus is the one who will last. I mean, long after they can kick a soccer ball and long after they don't make the team or they get injured long after, right, they have a family and don't have time for soccer, right? Long after they're old and they can't get, Jesus is gonna be the one who lasts. Are you teaching them Jesus? Are you showing them Jesus? How are you teaching your family about Jesus? Create traditions in your family. Hey, uh, growing up, my family, we always prayed before every meal. That's just something that was important to us. Hey, we always went to church. That was important to us. Hey, hey, listen, our family, my, my dad and my mom, they always prayed over me before I went to bed. That was important. Hey, at Christmas, it wasn't just about getting gifts. At Christmas every year, we read the Christmas story with our whole family. We all sat down and we read the, at Easter, it, it, Easter wasn't just an Easter basket. Man, we had these resurrection eggs. Those are the things. How are you teaching Jesus? How are you bringing Jesus into your family? Because this, discipleship is more caught than taught. Discipleship is more caught than taught. And when you're living out your faith, they're going to watch you. <laughs> when you're saying this is important, they're going to say that's important. When you say, hey, I need to be in a community group. I need us as a couple. I need us as a family. I need, I, need, I need a men's study. I need a women's study. I need a place where I go, where I'm learning, where I'm growing, and they're watching you. Uh, I'm a part of a men's Bible study. I'm a part of a community group. Lisa and I lead a community group every year, and we love it for 15 years. And man, just some of our best friends in there. It is awesome. Uh, but I'm also part of a men's group, and we meet, and uh, we were meeting at this guy's house. He couldn't do it that day. He was out of town, so we moved to this other guy's house, and we were meeting at 6.30 in the morning, and we were outside. It was a beautiful day. Was this back in the spring, and his wife like, sent me a picture of their two, their two girls standing at the window looking out at us doing Bible study, and she just texted and said, thank you so much. My girls are watching their dad study the Bible with a group of men. And I just thought, yeah, yeah. Guys, let them see you do it. One of my earliest memories, I don't remember if I was four or five, but I walked by my parents' rooms and my dad was on his knees by the bed. And I said, dad, what are you doing? And he said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Let them see you pray. <laughs> Let them see you reading your Bible. Let them watch you serve. Let them see you parking cars or, or at the door. My dad was a usher at our church. He was, a, he was the greeter when you walked in the church for like 40 years. Everybody knew him, right? You know? And I loved that. You know, hey, I love your dad. You know, and I was like, yeah. 
He wasn't perfect, you know, obviously, but man, I saw that in him. And the question for all of us, right? Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see Jesus in you? None of us are perfect. Not, uh, but man, are you striving? Are you growing? Are you learning? Are you pursuing Jesus? Are you pursuing Jesus? Hey, 15 years ago, I was standing in a hospital room with our first child, Grace. And I remember holding her in my arms, right? This little baby and just tears in my eyes like, am I ready for this? Right? God, are you, are you sure, you know? You're trusting this one to me. And I remember right there in that moment just going, God, she's yours. You take care of her. You protect her. You hold her, God. Give me wisdom to lead my family and to love them well. But God, I place her in your, your hands. And when it comes that moment, you just say, God, they're yours. And Father, through me, through the power of your Holy Spirit, let me disciple them and love them and guide them and lead them. You know that dad that sat with me at that restaurant and said, hey, would you pray for my boys? About one month ago at our Nolensville campus, his oldest son was baptized. He's a sophomore at the University of Tennessee. And see what was going on? Is he had enough of a spiritual foundation that when he got to UT, he found a church and he found a Bible study on campus and he found some guys who would pour into him and started saying to him, hey, have you taken this step? And he came home and said, dad, I want to talk to you about being baptized. The Bible says, train up a child the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Doesn't mean they won't go to a roundabout way, but man, trust God, they're yours. They're yours. And God, use me. I don't know where you are today, but I want you to know this, God's here. And God has called you for a time such as this. And it starts with your relationship with God. Guys, it starts right here. And maybe you're here today and you've been trying to do this whole thing on your own and you've been frustrated. Hey, it comes to surrender. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And Jesus, I want you in my marriage. And Jesus, I want you in my family. Jesus, my life is yours right here. And maybe, God, you're calling me to be baptized. What better example for your kids? Jesus was 30 when he was baptized, by the way. Maybe for you it's time. Hey, I need to get in a community group. I need to get in a Bible study. I need some godly people around me. Whatever it is, this is your time and do it. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. Where are you today? It starts with you, right? It starts with me. Is Christ the Lord of your life? <laughs> Have you surrendered your heart to him? Why not today? Just pray, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Come in. Forgive me. <laughs> Redeem me. Restore me. Maybe this morning, God's calling you to take a next step. To be baptized or to be in a community group or a Bible study. Maybe it's reading his word. Maybe this morning you just need to pray over your marriage or your future marriage. Maybe this morning you just need to put your kids in God's hand and say, God, they're yours. <laughs> they're yours. So Father God, here we are. Your people. You've entrusted precious lives to us. As parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, as a church. God, find us faithful. Let us be people who pour into them Jesus. Let us be people who model for them Christ. And none of us are perfect. Only you are perfect, God. And so forgive and redeem and restore us. But God, let us know that there's grace. And let us do what you've called us to do. We love you so much, Father. And we dedicate our lives and we dedicate our families to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. After the service, I'll be here. There'll be people on our A6 team. If you want to talk with somebody, you want to pray with somebody, just come on down, man. That's what we're here for, guys. We're all on this journey together. I want to invite our ushers.